Yo, have any of your plants? Oh, geez. Have any of your plants gotten any flowers yet? Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the one I named Pride. It's uh flowering first. Is it? Um, any that's nice. Yellow flowers? Yep. Ah, okay. Cool. That's the one that I have flowering. Kevin oh, likes okay. flowers. Yeah, they go away quickly though, but they're kind. Of, they're kind of pretty. Yeah, like, like tight, they, tight they yellow little pine cones morning. almost. <laughs> And then they disappear quickly. They yeah, yeah. Sleep. They, I, I don't know if they, they. I'm sure they, they self pollinate. <sighs> nice. Okay. Efficient. Um. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure Roy would approve. <laughs> okay. Um. I don't feel super confident about this game yet i usually feel more confident about levels once i get a little more into them and i like have a better feel for the personality of the level you know but um but i have everything planned that i need to have planned so we're gonna go for it confidence um we're recording yes we are. I haven't heard the creepy voice oh we are okay. um so uh, I have, I'm actually not going to roll for today's pregame question. I actually have something in mind that I think is a little bit more in-universe specific. Um, for today's pregame question, uh, we're going to do Zai last, but um, I would like everybody to go, can everybody go over all of the upgrades they did for their character, um, at least as many as you can remember? Um, and then pick one of them and give me a quick little, like, one to five minute uh, story involving how your character got that upgrade. Ooh. Would you guys be comfortable with that? I can do yeah. that. Yeah, I'd be cool yeah. with that. I'm down with that. Okay, yeah, let's have, yeah. Um, let's have Emil go first. All right, so... Um... I think the two that I remember, um, mm -hmm. I got upgrades to uh, my ship. Mm -hmm. That was the that was the big one. Um, but I think I got upgrades to to both. I got I two you, upgrades for the ship. You also upgraded your hardware skill, I think. Yeah, so I, I I got a better hardware skill, so I'm better I'm better with tinkering. I think that's just because I'm like been tinkering a bunch mm -hmm. on the, with the ship's systems. Um, I upgraded the my ship and it has a uh what's it called on it now a virtual what is it oh yeah there we go the sensor suite was the one i didn't so i have an upgraded sensor suite which gives us a plus two to gathering information uh and detecting other vehicles um and then i also have a locally hosted server that's the one i was going to talk about so after my discussion with roy about biological life and the specific form of life that Roy finds himself uh, involved in. Uh, Emil wanted to give the non-biological, like digital living beings on our ship a more comfortable like living situation. Hmm. Um, so there's a locally hosted server there that I'm that Emil is developing a chat bot for. So you log on to the server and the chat bot uh takes over for you talking to the uh talking to what's it called again the not the matrix but so when we talk about the network the network is a specific species of alien kind of like um the fuck what are they called from Xenos. star trek from um, oh the borg yeah they're kind of like the borg yeah um, except <laughs> not evil um or the cybermen from uh yeah from Doctor cybermen Who, were evil Doctor though um, yeah, both of those were evil. The the network are closer to good. Um, so the I think I've just been calling it the net, which is just like the oh. the, the galaxy wide internet. Yeah, yeah. So the I'm the server, the local server on the Galanga is one that like the the um, the machine sleeve people can just go on the server and chill and I'm develop and Emil is working on developing a system that will like 
take over talking to the net for you, so you can kind of dip out of the net if you need to do something private. I also like the idea that it can it can also take over your local body if you need to be gone for a few minutes. So your your body can just be standing in the middle of Walmart and be like, "Hello, friends. Would anybody like to buy some vitamins?" <laughs> <laughs> I assume what chatbot say. Right, right now, right now though, the server is just a server, so you can okay. go. You can go on there and chill if you need to be away from uh, the, the actual, like, yeah. Well, and, I mean, in real life, there are a lot of cool things you can do with a locally hosted server. Like, you yeah. guys essentially have your own, you guys have your own MySpace page. You have your own website, and you can do whatever you want with the website. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, I would like to hear from um, MX8 next. Are you up for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can go. I was just trying to look through my notes that from what we talked about. Uh -huh. So I think on the surface, I took uh, two skill upgrades. So I moved my resolve from one to two and my software from two to three. Okay. I thought and it then... just made sense narratively based on what Nate had been doing in the last couple of, of levels. You got an upgrade for your gun did you get mind killer rounds yeah so we actually talked about it a little bit and i can't remember if like the name for them was the same but i thought i was leaning more towards the emp oh right right um cool i think i ended up just not writing those down but yeah i um emp rounds would be really cool for you so um essentially bullets that um have some kind of chemical makeup uh, within the bullet that essentially explodes when it hits its target, except instead of just exploding, it explodes and lets off an electromagnetic burst that yep. can short circuit um, computers and stuff. Yeah, just like shorting out like small range electronics and stuff like that. And I figured that would have pretty cool implications. And they're also going to do physical damage because it still is a... <laughs> yeah, it's still a bullet. It still is a bullet. Um, but the other upgrade that I took was a... I think it, another skill, which is called Access Memory. Oh, right! I forgot about this. Yeah, and this allows me to hack into a sleeved or augmented individual's mindset, basically their brain CPU, and read their memories. Yeah. And um, this didn't me? say that there were any like negative drawbacks to doing that. Like, I mean, other than like the I mean, social ones, could, but like, is th can I be do stopped when I do it? To a person. Um, we'll decide that in fiction when it okay. comes up. I mean, if it is if it is something that has big um, like ramifications, I'm always going to make you roll for it somehow. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's very cool. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how MX8 acquired that ability? Yeah, I'm thinking like over time of just deep diving with the computer on the ship, on the bridge, uh, Mate was able to kind of pull back on some access that they did not have previously. And one of those skills was being able to dive deeper into like systems and specifically into sleep or augmented individuals. So, so Mate was doing it by accident is... and just practiced it because it was something that I think that That's networks, so cool. so, network people can do. Are you implying that this is something that existed inside of MX8 already, but he had lost access to it and he recovered his access to it while doing a similar thing to diving into memories while trying to generate an AI for the Gemini. Yeah, so it's basically like there are a bunch of limiters on yeah. like different access points and, and, and basically like mates random like read only memory <laughs> and was just like, wait, what is this? This doesn't make you, sense you, and, and kind you, of put it together. Like, accidentally uncovered the encryption to a folder. Mm-hmm. 
That's fantastic. I love that. Um, who wants to go next? I can go. <clears throat> um, okay. Let me drop. I'm only seeing the, the chat people. How do I get back to the general chat? Oh my god. Yeah. Boom! Check that guy out. That's Robert Pattinson. For some reason, he's the uh, the specific character that I have in mind for the backstory to one of my three upgrades. Okay. So, Brynn and I discussed this <laughs> at the most brief of levels, but I, I was on... I had some idea that there was a sexy billionaire playboy type, <laughs> and I think he looks like Robert Pattinson that exists on the Gemini somewhere, and that he came in the bar one day and he saw uh, Bloven doing his bartending skills. And <clears throat> you guys may not know this, but <clears throat> Bloven has a hover chair that previously has been completely unused in all of our missions so far. But I was hovering around the bar, and this guy basically convinced me that to up my bartending game to the next level, I could make it sexy. Bloven didn't really appreciate why someone would want to be sexy but he was intrigued so what ended up happening is this guy sort of you know convinced him to do all these upgrades to his chair and what it now looks like i don't have an analogous image for this but imagine that there is a bed at a given bed and breakfast or something that is or maybe like a love hotel or something and it is shaped like a heart and that's basically what Blovin's riding around on these days. And it hovers, too. <laughs> and uh, occasionally it has a secret weapon which sprays a, a fine, uh, like, um, cologne or perfume, depending on whoever's wow. sitting on it. And you just push a button and it just sprays this little mist, just fragrancing the air with sexiness. And Blovin doesn't really appreciate, maybe Blovin doesn't even have oh a good sense of smell. It's very possible. I mean, do fish smell? I don't know. <laughs> but he it's occasionally very accidentally smell. presses this button and becomes accidentally sexy sometimes. And <laughs> he doesn't quite appreciate why all of this is captivating to bartender uh, bar goers, but um, nonetheless, he's fascinated by just doing whatever it takes to sort of be the America's next top bartender. And uh, so that's that's basically the story behind his sexy hover chair uh and then the other two upgrades that i have is like a kevlar infused scrubs so yeah <laughs> yeah go ahead what um you said at one point that when you were thinking of the hover chair you were picturing vibes from the austin powers movie and if you just yeah. if you think about what would a hover chair look like if austin powers owned it that's what we're thinking of. That's pretty much what we're going with. So it's, it's so not, good. It's not explicitly sexually erotic. That was one of the <laughs> sort of piggybacking off of the previous games erotic. <laughs> uh, we were thinking that that could be a way that we go, but you know, I think it's more consistent with Blovin and where you know he's he's gonna be a little bit more like um, Austin Powers esque. Like um, there's symbols of. Uh, sexiness more so than like I don't know an explicit dildo or something <laughs> so yeah no um, I love it so much well do you remember what your third thing was did you get a mental power yeah, uh, yeah a touch of peace so now oh. it, as the description reads I can touch a gentle hand upon um, an ally and remove their stress points for a scene I think once per day or once per scene I guess and yeah. um it doesn't define how I touch them, though. So <laughs> if I wanted to combine the previous use of sexiness and the touch of peace instrumentally, I suppose it could be possible. And I think in in fiction, it is just you've gotten very good at, like, relaxing people. Um, yeah. And so you can use that in fiction however feels appropriate. Yeah, yeah. It's basically just like a pat on the back with... Uh, passion. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Avalyn, you, I remember having some cool stuff with you. Do you want to talk about yours? Sure. So, I decided to go the route of, I'm trying to find it, I lost it. Here we go. Um, 
Evelyn decided to go more the route of diving more into her warp powers. So, for roleplay purposes, I would guess that she probably took some time and actually, like, spent some time away from the ship and went back to chill with the children of the warp so she could do some more training. Yeah. And, uh... I, I know you asked me this question like a long time ago and I don't know if I ever answered it or not but I think for the sake of roleplay purposes uh, there is a Nova that generally trains me in the warp practices and I've decided that her name is Starfire <laughs> because I needed to do yeah, that and it. I never did. <laughs> yeah. Do, um, I, know, do I, I know a lot of Nova. Do I know Starfire? Um... I'm all right with it. Yeah, I would think that maybe Starfire came to the ship with me a couple of times, and you guys okay. probably met that way. For but, the sake, I, I, I would also like to guess that she's got, and this is totally just me being, like, cutesy, but she's got the exact personality of Starfire from... Yes! Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um... So... I decided to go more into training up my warp abilities, and I came out of it with uh, two abilities called Warp Dive, and uh, I think the other one's just called Slip. So basically, Avalyn, and the reason I think that she decided to do this was she's starting to get the feeling that she's losing control ever so slightly of her real life more and more just with things of the nature of like oh Knox has another girlfriend now and it makes me upset even though i never want to acknowledge it or talk about my feelings or oh i was kind of into this other guy on the ship and now he's weird and <laughs> yeah and so she's just like having these moments where she feels like she doesn't have control in the physical world so she would probably feel better if she at least had more control in the warp so now um Evelyn can uh, manipulate time around a certain zone. I think that's what uh, the slip is. I can just choose a zone and be like, oh, time is slower or faster here at will. And yep. um, Warp Dive is more of an ability where it would be useful for... Is espionage a good word? I feel sure. like it would probably be more useful for watching things, but basically, Avalyn can now go into a complete comatose-like state and just wander around in the warp. I mean, you're literally astral projecting in yeah. the most literal of sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the only uh, downside is that my body is basically vulnerable while I do so, but I could basically run around and look through, like, look at things in the warp and, like, gather intel, or I could either attack things in the warp. Yep. Um, and it, that is an enhancement of your third eye ability, and I think I, I really like that being something that you build upon, because that's a very cool part of uh, Avalon. Um... Uh, yeah, and I like the I like the idea of the slip. I want to say I think that one. Hmm. So when I'm having issues with anxiety, I often wish that I could get time to just like slow down um, and stuff like that. And I I like the idea that um, part of why Avalyn. Um, decided to develop that ability is because, like you said, she's having a very, like, anxious period right now, and the the um, ability to just slow things down is very appealing to her. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, no, that's absolutely part of it. Like, especially because in terms of, like, just knocks and other things it's probably one of those things where she feels incredibly powerful with what abilities that she already had previously but it still felt like she had almost no control mm -hmm. and so i would guess that she probably talked to starfire like what are some other things that i could do and starfire just kind of offhand mentions it like you can play around with time if you want and she's just like no tell me more about that <laughs> fantastic um ruda now ruda we did some very fun things with your character. 
Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Go for it. So, Ruda, just for those of you who didn't know, has always been an amateur wrestling. <laughs> and she's somewhat of a celebrity in the circle. In fact, it's the luchador. He's a luchador. Oh, yeah. His name is El Chubacabra. <laughs> Perfect. Jesus Christ. We were supposed to pick, was it two or three, by the way? Three. Okay, uh, and my last little aside is that Avalon also has rocket powered legs now, so yeah. she does rocket powered kicks. <laughs> so excited for that one. Okay, great. So, uh, Ruda has a history as a pro wrestler. Go on. Yeah, so he, he was, like, pretty famous a couple of years ago and had, like, a horrible, horrible, terrible accident one night in a cage fight. A laser cage fight. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about it. But ever since then, wow. like, you see him at bars, people are going to come up to him, be like, yo, I am on your side, bro. And then they'll be like, let me buy you a drink. And Rude is like, yeah. get the fuck away from this me. Is, and he doesn't like to talk about it. But people recognize him. The celebrity stunt. And I love your take on the celebrity stunt. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually, I want to say that I think the way that this came up in fiction, because obviously this is not something that happened in the past couple weeks, but I like to imagine that um, at some point in the last couple weeks, while you were training with Charlie, like um, the, the the TV in the gym was like playing through uh, old ESPN Ultimate um, episodes, and uh, there was an episode that came on of like Ruda's last match, and uh, that's how we get introduced to it in the story. <laughs> there was a VH2 special where are they now semi pro wrestler edition, and he was on that documentary as well. If anybody had seen it, um, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> I'm liking I'm liking Mikhail's gift too. Um, I think uh, Kevin is about to upload something very good. So wait, um, so how long did you wrestle? Like, did you retire? Oh, for years, bro. Like, 20 years. So were you, like, into forced retirement, or is this kind of one of those things where people don't know that you still sometimes moonlight as a wrestler? Yeah, people don't know. That's good. That's very good. I want to say, then, that I have seen a video of you wrestling, but I don't know that it's you. Because because he wore a mask, right? Oh yeah, no, definitely. But I really, I'm, I also, into, I'm into the wrestler. I also, I love it. Can can we enjoy the fact that both Ruda and Mate have um, secret masked alter egos? Yep. Don't we have to talk about them. <laughs> this is gonna happen. Oh, yeah. and so like. On. For the other one, Ruda saw a commercial and wanted like really strong muscles, so he got this like cyber cyber technology that he knows nothing about that makes his muscles really strong and makes him like basically super strength. Remember that that Ruda's whole thing is that he's a cyborg, but he doesn't use um, human cybernetics. He uses elfin cybernetics, which are like yeah. biological. So we have this gardener on the ship who hasn't come up as a character yet. But she works in the gardens, and in addition to um, all the other things she does for the ship, including like making food for the ship and stuff like that, and you know, sustaining the oxygen uh, processing on the ship, um, she uh, maintains Ruda and the other Alefin's um, uh, Alefin equipment, which is. Um, essentially grown and repaired like plants. Um, and so I think that this is literally just like 
I'm imagining it as like a series of vines that uh, like she grows them out of the ground and then she pl like drapes them over your arms like a um almost like an exoskeleton on your arm made up of vines and then they kind of like sink into your skin a bit so you've got these like these leafy vines all over your your um upper back and uh upper torso and your arms and they are like embedded into the skin and they give you super strength weird it's cool right damn <laughs> i i really want to i really want to hang up on the um the alpin cybernetics yeah. because it's such a cool idea to me okay um did you oh and you got you got a a flamethrower a big old flamethrower and it's an alefin flamethrower so um i i guess that means that it just looks like a tree trunk with like <laughs> <laughs> you know you know when you're in, walking in the woods and you find one of those tree trunks that's like hollow i'm imagining it's like that and then just Gouts of fire shoot out of the hollow part. I love it. Yeah. Nice. So, um, Zai just mm -hmm. messaged me the upgrades that, um, that Roy is taking, and I think they're all fantastic. Cool. Yeah, uh, so you should go over these, because they're very entertaining. Okay. Um, so the first upgrade to a weapon that Roy has is the Beam Saber Improvement. Oh, and I forgot that I didn't write out how I came about these, so I'll go into that in a minute. Yeah, you um, didn't have to write it out. The first one's a Beam Saber Improvement that I'm calling Segmented Coherence. Uh, this allows the Beam Saber to function as a whip by adding tactile shells in sections of the beam suspended by a repeating short burst Gravitron. Uh, and an increase to the Saber's base power output, which allows it to extend its limb. So basically, it's it's sort of like Trevor Belmont's whip. <laughs> yeah. Um, in game function, this would function. This in game function, this would be as a grapple complementing the mag platform, so I can like reach certain areas that I might not be able to just with the mag platform. Um, a grapple and pull move, uh, and as a live wire conduit for divine energy. It's the Belmont reference. Um, yeah. No, I think that's um, I think that's cool as hell. Cool. Um, and we're only going to need to do a story for one of these. So you've okay. got that, and then you did a machine pistol upgrade. Yep. Uh, so that is upgrading it to a heavy machine pistol. Um, three more barrels have been added to Roy's machine pistol. So think about it like one central barrel and then the other three, uh, sort of like a pyramid shape on it. Um, in essence, making it into a mini Gatling gun. Uh, special shock absorbers are sourced by divine energy, giving significant recoil resistance, so my arm isn't flying all over the place when I'm shooting. Um, in game, this would function. Uh, the function would be to just increase the chances that the machine pistol could actually hit an enemy, and for close range enemies, it would multiply level of damage. Uh, it could multiply level of damage by four. Um, yeah, so I'll work over that i'm trying to not do multiplications for okay. damage um but i'll i'll only put the numbers on it to reference yeah, yeah. the number of barrels uh, yeah. so whatever um, it is it would just be a damage increase it would for be close a range, increase, and um i'll definitely give it like an aspect that helps with accuracy so that's cool um and then your third one is a stunt yep the third one is a stunt that uses Roy's disc drone that I'm calling disc drone projection. Roy's drone can be used to project tactile holographic environments and or individuals over a 500 foot radius. So kind of like a mobile emitter from Star Trek. <laughs> the holograms aren't particularly effective at causing injury, but they can block many or some attacks and they can cause severe psychological distress, confusion and misdirection. Now, the story that I have is actually behind that one. I guess it's not really a story, okay. just a narrative reason. Um, mm -hmm. It's because of MX-8. Oh, surprise Roy... emoji? <laughs> Roy's experience uh, in the labs that we basically destroyed or cut off from contact um, got Roy to thinking about how to avoid situations like that again in the near future. Um, 
So first, he, he already had the ability to like create holograms and do a holographic scan of areas, which is what he used his drone for in the first place uh, during that scene. Um, but the ability to make them appear real was what Roy wanted, and that could only be achieved by giving them a tactile response, actually being able to feel the hologram. Um, so yeah, this is just an improvement that Roy made on his disc drone using his own sure. software abilities. Yeah, so I'm imagining it is a like, it's essentially like a, uh, fuck, what's it called? A, a projector that is, that is projecting out these uh, holographic images. And then there's like adjacent to the projector, there's like a force field projector that projects a force field in the same yeah. shape as the holographic images. Yeah. So like I was just thinking about the many ways this could be used. For example, we could make we could use this to make people believe that we're in two places at once. <laughs> and actually have our party look like they're picking up things and moving around things and interacting with things, but we're not really there. We're somewhere else doing something else. Yeah. I'm gonna that's very powerful. So I'm gonna probably put some limitations on it in terms of like how many minutes it can be used for at a time or something That's like fair. that. But we'll figure that out um, in the future. I'm not too interested in it right now. That's a, cool. that's a dope upgrade. Yeah, that's very cool. That is everyone, right? I think so. Okay. Um, so, productive uh, couple of weeks. So, you get to the new star system, which is in diocese territory. Um, you are you're looking around and um, keeping an eye out for different interesting looking jobs in the region, which is always the first thing you do when you arrive at a new place. Um, and I think maybe you find a couple potential candidates and you guys are mulling over which one you would want to take when, hmm, who would it be? Hmm. Okay. Either Blovin, Ruda, or Avalyn gets a phone call. Which one do you think it was? Avalyn. Avalyn, I was gonna say right. Ruda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I like I like Avalyn. So, Avalyn, um, you get a phone call, and it is um, it's somebody that you have talked to uh, in the past because he has worked tangentially with um, the Children of the Warp. He is not a member of the Children of the Warp, but um, he has helped you guys on uh, with stuff when when you're in the region. Um, okay. He is a um, an alfin by the name of Anwar, and oh my uh, god, yeah. So you get a call from <laughs> from Anwar uh, because he got a notification that you are in the system. I assume he's just like you know keeping a track on all ships that are coming in and out of the system. Yeah, and totally casual. Yeah, he asks if you would be interested in um, meeting up with him and discussing a, a job that he needs help with urgently. Uh, I absolutely would be. I, I feel like Avalon would just kind of like pull the phone down real quick and be like, hey, one of my coolest friends ever is calling me and wants our help with something. Do you guys want to go help my cool friend with something? Ruda, you're cool, right? Come on, you need to help with someone who's cool. <laughs> that makes me so happy, the idea of being like, being like, shut up, everyone, it's my cool friend. Um, <laughs> like, is definitely very cool. Um, yeah, okay, so, um, so if you agree, then, um, Anwar is going to, uh, oh, man, at first I was going to say that they, at first I was planning to have this meeting happen on the Gemini, but because of how this has gone so far, I think it's better if it happens in, like, a cafe in town. Right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
You guys definitely have to go meet Evelyn's cool friend in a cafe in time. I, I need to see Anwar's face. Yeah. I mean, Evelyn, your social favorability is inefficient, but I will follow. Um, I'm going to try to... Let's see how this goes. Uploading, uploading, uploading. Ooh, okay. I haven't shown this picture yet, have I? No, that's a new one. I don't one. think so. Okay. Um, this was one that I was going to use for the Aelfin Embassy that you guys never went to. So, um, mm. uh, yeah. So this is the this is the general vibe of this um, this cafe that you guys end up at. That looks so cool. And uh, lots of different alien species, lots of plants and solar panels and um, stuff like that. And I'm going to copy over. Um, there's Anwar meets you there, and he is with another Aelfin um, who looks somewhat similar to him. I don't like this EA thing at the bottom. I don't know what the EA uh, is, I know. but I, I get a... Um, Amil gets a strange feeling that possibly it's evil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, these two here on the... I'm sorry, they're teeny tiny at the bottom of the cafe. I don't want to compete <laughs> with all of the actual people in this cafe. Um, so, um, you guys come in and, uh... I think Anwar is the first to introduce himself to everyone, and Anwar is like chipper and friendly and um, and very like confident, and he's a little bit of a jock. Um, so, uh, am I missing anyone here? Uh, oh, I need MX8. Where's MX8 at these days? There he is. Um, so he introduces himself. And then next to him, uh, much more stoically, uh, the woman just says, and I'm Malatni. Um, the Anwar is explicitly not dressed like an Aelfin. Um, he doesn't have the, like, the very, like, fluid, graceful yeah. robes and stuff that you associate with them, with bright colors and all that. He's wearing just straight up galactic standard low class fashion. He's wearing the equivalent of like a you know, a t-shirt and shorts. Um he also has a uh a submachine gun and just like a like a bowie knife. Like two explicitly straight up non elfin weapons. Um his sister Malati is wearing very bougie, um, like, nice ceremonial, uh, elfin robes that are nonetheless look like they have been designed for action. I'm thinking kind of like... A diplomat? Um, I'm thinking more like if you think of the concept art for, like, a Jedi, like, scout class kind of character. Mm. This um, one looks formidable. Yeah. Um, they do look like siblings. They have the same color hair, same color skin, similar facial features. Um, but polar opposite ends of the fanciness spectrum, so to speak. Um, how would you guys like to begin the scene? I ready my weapon. <laughs> wow. Um, I feel like Anmar and Avalon are probably doing some like really elongated secret handshake they came up with forever ago, but since it's been so long, they keep forgetting some of the steps, so it's taking obnoxiously long. And, and Malati is rolling her eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I'm gonna say you've never met Malati before. Only Anwar. Um, they are not usually seen together oh interesting okay I'm so probably giving anwar some shit for it too like why have i never met your sister she's probably just as cool as you uh, she's 
probably still yeah. rolling her eyes at me. And Laura's <laughs> like, no, she's not. She's a total narc. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you guys uh, finish your very elaborate handshakes. You get down at a a table and Malati just immediately wants to get down to business, but Anwar raises a hand and starts like ordering drinks for the table. And um, as soon as he's done ordering drinks, Malati takes over and she says, um, we don't have much time to waste here. Our, um, our homeland, our world ship, the Fatimaru, has been destroyed by the notions. Oh man, you know, I was not going for a Russian accent here. Got it. And I completely <laughs> love it. Um, yes, uh, the Fatima Wu has been destroyed by the notions. And um, we are in the process of getting it back, but the rest of the fleet is very far away, and every day that passes is great danger. Um, I we would like assistance with getting on there and taking back something that is very important and um, sending out an SOS beacon. Roy is immediately suspicious and says, because dishonest, dishonest eventide, a poor plebeian speaking betrayed by the noble and looks toward the sister. Hmm. <laughs> I don't, I do not know what he means. <laughs> <laughs> Does he not trust me because of my next? <laughs> Roy, stop being uncool. These are my cool friends. Yeah, so Roy, Roy is basically enough. suggesting that their appearance and how they are so different would suggest that there's something more going on than what he's saying. Um. Right, so, um, <laughs> Anwar steps in here, and he's going to say, yeah, Melody's being a little uptight about all this, and commence eye roll, and then commence, like, shoulder slam, whatever that move is called. Um, shoulder slam? When, like, somebody's, like, gives you an eye roll, and you're like, oh, oh you just mean, like, they nudge it. Right. Oh. Um... Not like, not like Ruda move. Not like how Ruda was on Friday night. <laughs> yeah. the, the, that, that move is actually called the Ruda. Um, yeah, so Anwar says, this is, I haven't lived on the Fatima Ru for over a decade now. Um, but uh, yeah, it is still my home, and um, it was a pretty horrific event that happened. Almost everybody on the ship, except for Melody, was killed, and um, the problem is, uh, normally, if it was, if it was just like, let's say, Terran Raiders or something like that that took out one of our ships. We could just get to an Aelfin embassy, start passing the word down the grapevine, and eventually we would have the armada assembled and they would all come and take back the ship. The problem is, these are Zenotians. They're a plague. They're an infestation that are defiling our homeland as we speak. And while I try not to be too sentimental towards you know, stuff. There are a few things in there that are very important that need to be recovered and cannot at any, need to be prevented from being corrupted at any cost. Most importantly is 
the heart stone. And um, Ruda, this is something you would be very familiar with. The heart stone is, um, you know how Aelfins have their soul stone and when they die, their soul goes into it and then they can use that stone to interface with other pieces of Aelfin technology. Yeah. Um, the heart stone is a massive soul stone at the center of an Aelfin world ship that um, can hold an unlimited number of Aelfin spirits. And so traditionally, um, when an Aelfin dies, they either um, choose to spend some amount of time working as a machine, essentially, such as Ruda's um, Wraith body, which is inhabited by the ex-girlfriend of his father, I think. Um, yeah. Or they choose to inhabit the heartstone of their world ship and essentially go into a, like, self-contained afterlife where they are eternally part of the community and they serve as, like, voices of wisdom to the community and they help, like, perform services on the world ship, but also it is just their closed-off little heaven. Um... So there is a stone in the Fatimaru, in the in its capital, that contains the souls of every generation of Aelfin who have ever lived on this planet, which is somewhere between billions and trillions um, oh, crap. of spirits. So that's a lot of souls, and if uh, if that stone were to be corrupted, we don't know what would happen if um, the Zenotians started like absorbing it or, or you know, melting it with their like acids and, <coughs> and stuff like that. But it would probably be very bad for the billions or trillions of souls trapped inside. Why so, don't you send them out of game question for a second? Yeah. What are the what are the Zenotians? Are they biological or are they synthetic? They are biological. They, okay, that's what um, I thought. <laughs> so everybody would be aware of them. They're very much they're basically the Zerg from right, Star right, Trek. Right, right. They're a um insectoid uh species. They're they're not truly insectoid, but they're the big scary species that is the ultimate threat to the galaxy kind of thing. Gotcha. They're the Tyranids. I was, gonna, yeah. I was asking that because Roy would have looked, looked towards MX-8 and said, why does one biological form of life find its existence superior to that of another form of life? Um, Are they not the same? MX-8, I will say the network have very similar feelings, perhaps even stronger feelings towards the notions that they do towards demons. Really? Okay. Yeah, they're actually very. Mm, they have a there. There are similarities. Okay, so they just have some bad blood there. Yeah. Um, one thing that everybody in the galaxy, well, everybody who has any experience with um, the warp and its stuff related to that knows that is a little bit unique is um. The Zenotians are the only biological species in the galaxy that does not have a warp shadow. They are essentially all sleeved in that they don't have warp shadows. Mm hmm. Uh, okay. Lovin's going to uh, try to take a tender moment and say, I'm so glad that you survived, Maladi. That must have been very difficult, and he will glow sympathetically. And as he does so, he sort of <laughs> leans forward and accidentally hits the sexy button, and a perfume sprays oh, into the God. air. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also just imagining that, like... Roy unbuttons his top sh his top button. Is it getting hot in here, guys? <laughs> These biologicals confuse me. I also think that it starts letting out, like a like, a faint, soft light. Uh, like like a soft <laughs> pink light. It uh, pulsates a little bit. Yeah, though. very white. <laughs> start playing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. She's she says. Um, yes, it was. Um, 
it was very hard. We we lost our parents, and I lost all of my friends. Um, but none of that matters now. What matters is that we recover the soul stone. Um, the hot stone. So, this is the mission they would like your help with. Um, getting to the world ship, landing on the world ship, which again is like the size of a small planet, um, certainly several continents in size, um, and then uh, navigating cross country to the, um, the capital city of this world ship and recovering the Heartstone, all while fighting your way through a Zenotian horde. Is Anwar or M Malati going to provide us, like, gate codes to get in? Because isn't it... Wouldn't that be very difficult just to be like, hey, I think we need to be here on this world ship? Um, so everybody on the world ship is dead. Um, the world ship doesn't actually have, like, um... There's no security have, like, protocols? Um, it does have security protocols that you would pass, um, if you were dealing with, like, government logistics. Um, but it's more like what we have at airports today, where you have to, like, announce your, you know, your name, what is your reason for visiting, you know, prove that you're a, a person who is, like, safe to be allowed to land, and if you are not, then they would send out, like, fighter jet. But, yeah. um... Yeah. Okay. So. What do you guys think? I think we'll we do it. Do. We'll do it. But I do have one question for Malati. Why are you sending a small band of adventurers when you should send, when it sounds like you might want to send an army? Indeed. We do want to send an army. Um, I will accompany the party on this, but only to learn more of these Zenotians. <laughs> The, the problem is um, we would want to send the Elfin, Elfheim army, collect the armada of our ships and bring it down as one singular force against this enemy. Um, and that would take months to coordinate and get all the ships together for a coordinated attack. And we have days maybe weeks before the Hearthstone is corrupted and destroyed eternally. Okay. We don't have time for an army. We'll do it! Good. For a price. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> they don't have... Um, they don't have a lot of money on them they're not very we're gonna start people. walking away um hold on <laughs> but uh right now the entire planet is a, a graveyard and um the reward they can offer you is basically anything you can carry off of the planet mm. <laughs> like everyone there is dead I mean, it sucks to be essentially, like, grave robbing, but it, if that's what it takes to get the, like, their souls are what matters. So. Can I talk to the, can I talk to my crew for a second? Certainly. Um, <laughs> Anwar sure. and Malati will get up and uh, go to the bar to get drinks, and, like, as soon as they're two steps away from you, they start bickering. <laughs> I'm gonna look to, uh my crew, and I'm going to be like, look, if, if we're able to take anything we want, I might be able to very quickly upgrade the Galanga with, like, uh, with, like, an extra, like, cargo space. And we should rent, we should rent a tow truck from, uh, the, uh, what's it called? Oh, God, main ship. Blanking. Gemini. The Gemini. Gemini. Yeah, we should rent a tow truck from the main ship to get as much stuff as possible once we get the Hearthstone. 
Okay. Um, I'm just gonna. Mate's gonna raise their hand. Uh huh. Hey. Um. So I was watching this documentary last week, and it talks about this cargo ship that goes down to this abandoned planet, and it ends up really bad for them because they find alien monsters. Do you think that could happen to us? Was the documentary the movie Alien? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to look at Game Over. <laughs> I mate, I'm sure I'm a hundred percent sure that's going to happen to us. I'm I'm going to do my best impression of frowning. <laughs> that does sound really, really cool. Roy looks at Mace and says, this would actually be preferable. There is much we can learn from these creatures as far as what I've heard thus far. I mean, based on the documentary, the only people that can get hurt by the aliens are organics, so maybe it's not exactly. that bad. Exactly. We'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, You'll be fine. I'm going to look at Nate and Roy and I'm going to be like, the bill's still out on whether I'm organic. <laughs> I guess we'll find uh, out. We'll so, um, oh, jeez, what was I thinking Blubbin about? Is, uh, I'll give you my pinky. <laughs> Blubbin would like to take some samples, if we can, to see if we can research some of the, uh, the, the, the properties of the Zenotian life. Um, but he also recommends that we should really be careful, because if we're not too careful, we might accidentally track in some invasive species from spores or what have you that might be on the planet still. And mm -hmm. it oh, could have uh, very bad effects for wherever we go after this. Yeah, um, there's definitely going to be a long, like, uh, disinfecting process uh, when you guys get back. Um, you guys are all going to be essentially de -loused. <laughs> um yeah that mate has no real objections other than worrying that like this could be detrimental to the party overall but sure. we'll always kind of go with the group just to find um, some new stuff roy is very interested and for all the wrong reasons yeah so <laughs> um when you guys get back together with anwar and maladi um they're going to bring up one other complication that they want your advice on and that is that um, this is, while we don't have time to coordinate with an army, this is probably a bigger job than any one cell can handle on its own. There's <clears throat> probably going to be multiple different instances where you're going to need to split up and um, one team takes care of one thing while another team takes care of another thing. Um, they want to know if you have any other groups that you trust that could come on this mission with us. And um, I was thinking this would be a great chance to have you guys go on a co-op mission with, um, let's see, what were they called? The Wombats? The Wombats. Wombats. Yeah, the Wombats. Um, what do you guys think about that? Yes. I don't know, Ruta, what do you think about that? Nico <laughs> needs to join us. This potential <laughs> Zenothian genocide. Yeah. So, um, the way this is going to work, this is out of, out of fiction. Um, the way this is going to work is you guys and the Wombats are both going to go down together. And um, at regular intervals, you guys are going to do some stuff as a whole group. And then there are going to be places where, like, two different things need to happen at the same time. And so I will give you guys the choice which of those you want to do. And you and Anwar go take those. And the Wombats and Maladi go take the other one. Um, and then we are going to do that several times as we work our way through the level. Um, okay. With all that out of the way... Do you guys have any questions about um, what to expect or any specifics about the situation? I would like to know more about the, uh, I can hear echo for myself. 
um, corruption that the Zenotians are doing to the elfin souls in this Hearthstone? Like, what, what, what does that entail? Like, what does that mean? Um, this is actually the first time that we've had. Um, this is actually the first time that that has come up, kind of. Um, never before has an elfin world ship been conquered by the notions okay. so um we don't know what that damage would look like we know um we know that the the notions are famous at being able to absorb biological life and um and twist it and add it to their own um arsenals they will essentially they'll go to a planet and then uh, kill anything on that planet that is a threat to them, and then everything else they capture and absorb, and then add that to their, like, biological pool, which they can use to create newer, more powerful members of their species. Um, mm. They okay. also will take um, living organic species on a planet and use them as test subjects to experiment on different uh, features, so to speak. Um, like, hey, we're looking on it. We're working on a new prototype of wing or something. So rather than testing that on our people, we're going to uh, take these these pigs and stick some wings on them and see how that goes. So when you're fighting the notions, you're usually fighting the notions the species of pseudo humanoid monster things and you're also fighting the the notion spawn which is just a eclectic mix of monsters essentially okay um, so they're all cronenbergs cool yeah. <laughs> so Next uh, but they I, don't have warp shadows so i guess no that warp. I guess that's the point where I'm a little was a little confused. Like, well, they don't have warp shadows. But I guess that's the mystery. Then, what are they trying? What could they do to these souls? Oh, that's a good that's a good point. Um, we don't know what they would do to the souls. We do mm -hmm. know that an Aelfin's soul stone, and by extension, their world ship's heart stone, are both um, biological materials. They are. Uh, they're they're basically like something between a heart and a bone um it is an actual organ um kind of you know what it's like it's like a seed on a plate um okay. like a seed looks like it's just a rock but in reality it's a very complicated biological thing um so if the infestation gets to it we don't know what would happen to the souls inside but we do know that they would destroy or horrifically mutilate the um, the Hearthstone, and in doing so, probably destroy the souls inside. Best case scenario. Cool. I mean, not so, cool. But okay. Cool. <laughs> this this mission seems like it exposes us to a terrific amount of uh, organic specific threat. So I'm wondering if Ruta, Avalon, and Blovin, which I think are three patently organic, or at least somewhat organic folks in the party, can get some, like, cool power armor or something to <laughs> engage with this mission. Like, basically the equivalent of just, like, some standard-issue space suits. Um, Roy is also yeah. much yeah. to his grin, 100% human. Yep. Okay. Um, which sucks. So <laughs> good question. Um, it's interesting because normally I would say you guys are not proficient in power armor, but that's not a good reason in fiction to say that you can't um, you can't have it. So, um, like uh, more more so as just a defense or an insulation from the environment than something that gives us unique abilities. Yeah. No. I, I like this. How about we just have like a um, essentially like a like a space suit, an environmental protection suit. 
Mm -hmm. In fact, I um I think that is one of the um I think that's one of the things that I have here. Hold on. Click, click, click. Um here. Well, Roy can just cast hard light object on himself. Oh, you do have that ability? Mm-hmm. Good. Good. Um Yes. Uh and I swear I had a um Well, maybe I don't have a picture of it. But yeah, there is a um there is a piece of gear you can get that is essentially a hazmat suit. Here, I found it. Um I'm gonna mm. drop this in images. Alright. Okay, yeah, so you guys can get yourself a nice um, hazmat suit. That can go over your existing armor. Um, I will say, I love that. In fiction, if your character, like, if you get, like, a tear in your hazmat suit, then that'll be a cool story dilemma for us to figure out. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. That's a little ominous. <laughs> that is that is very telling. That'll be a dilemma. <laughs> you should not have laughed like that. The idea of a um, of a hazmat suit. I wasn't even thinking about that. But yeah, thanks for um, adding that to the fiction. Yeah. No, that's you don't want to get Cronenberg. I mean, <laughs> no, that's great, and um, and I think that we can do some things like um, we can talk about maybe these being like. Um, self-repairing hazmat suits uh, that will, like, yes, if they get pierced, you have a chance of infection at the time, but then it's not like the suit is ruined or something like that. Um, but all around a uh, very cool concept. Wait, Amil has an idea. What is your idea? All right, all right, all right. Are you ready? Boom. I'm ready. All right. A mill is going to design a little system with a canister of like compressed mm. nitrogen, and it's going to sense whenever there's like a rip in the suit and fill the suit with compressed nitrogen to like push out any infection. Like it, it has positive pressure, so it pushes outward. And it and it does it maintains that until the suit repair is complete. It sends you an alert that says you have until this canister runs out of compressed nitrogen mm -hmm. to fix the problem, or you'll get or you'll run the risk of an infection. That's cool. Um, I did. I was not prepared for us to run a fucking infestation focused uh chapter in the middle of COVID season. <laughs> so nope, but that's what we're doing. It's what we're doing now. Um, Games are informed by real life. Role playing? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So we're still role God playing. Ball was informed by army vets losing limbs. I mean, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this D&D game is turning into LARPing at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is great. So I think that we are on a good space for um, getting started. Um, so. Oh, I had one more question. Yeah, go for it. In in the Xenotians merging and adapting of other biologicals to themselves, like, do they have any, I mean, these things basically sound a lot like the alien from uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. So I'm wondering if they can actually look like normal things or if and they, they always not, will look like abominations. They are not shapeshifters. Not okay. in that sense. Oh, thank God. Um, cool, 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 cool. So, cool. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, that we know of. So, I mean, <laughs> you no, know, what you do know is that they have the, the full suite of... Um, evolutionary adaptions of every planet that they have ever um colonized oh, so that's any an evolutionary adaptions, <laughs> yeah. um 
Hey, Nate, could you go through like an <laughs> online database to see if they've uh, taken over any shape-shifting colonies? I actually <laughs> think that there probably is an online database mm -hmm. of like known Zenotian, because Zenotians are not a new thing. This has been a threat to the galaxy from before humanity took to the stars, um, long before. It's hosted, it's hosted um, on the ancient progenitor GeoCities website. <laughs> yeah, is, is is there some way that I I I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to roll for that if if that's something I can roll for? Like, is that yeah. like an occult thing or? Sure. I was I was gonna say it's literally um like like literally every civilization in the galaxy has to have a protocol for dealing with Zenotians. So if anything, it would be like hacking into a military database. But even oh. then, I imagine there's probably a like. Uh, a fucking like um what are they called uh a general service announcement kind of website that's like hey has your community been taken over by the notions here's what you need to know in your remaining okay. 10 seconds <laughs> yeah um don't go outside and breathe that my asthma <laughs> so yeah so yeah. what should i what should i roll for that is that more software then we don't have research anymore. Um, I would take either education or software. All right, I'll go ahead and roll software then. Um, give me a second before we interpret those results. I want to look at your aspect because I think one of your things is like built for research. Um, sleeve, uh, well, you have the natural hacker sleeve, um, thing if you need it. How'd we do? Uh, rolled an 11. 11's good. 11's very good. Remember, it, 7 is normal. Okay, so, cool. I was about to say, I'm like, I'll also roll an add natural hacker if needed, but if the 11 gets us what we need, I'd go for that. No. 11's perfect. Especially because this is not hard information to find. I think there is a public database that has general information on Zenotians, but it doesn't have like strategic information on what their specific abilities are and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you are able to hack into a government database that has like the full military profile on Zenotians and you know, the, what the military understanding of them is. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd share that all out with the group. I'll send out a group yeah. text. So yeah, the party has access to, oh man. Um, I mean, there's no reason to not have it. It is a, an aspect of the fiction. So yeah, the whole party has access to, um, give me a word to represent this information. Um, mm, <laughs> I think specs is going to be in there is a notion mm -hmm. of is that an aspect that that yeah. we can we can call on so every member of the party uh who reads this document um is going to have access to the aspect the notion spec um uh mate you can add it to your character sheet and anybody else who wants to add it can um if you don't want to deal with the trouble you can just remember that you have it and then cite it from somebody else's character sheet. Uh, what section do I add that under? Is that like just directly under like where culture is? Shit. Um, isn't there one temporary that is aspect. like... Um, oh yeah, bet. Thank you. <laughs> it is tempor temporary. Yeah. And temporary doesn't necessarily mean like literally temporary. It can also just mean that like this is not something that's always going to be relevant. Like, if you, you know, learn the phone number of a security guard, you don't need to have that down as, like, a core aspect of who your character is for all of progenity. It's just, like, it's relevant for this chapter. And then we can kind of forget about it. So where where is it put, though? Sorry. I was just... Temporary. Temporary. Yeah, put it under temporary aspect. Oh, um, it's under aspects. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's called the notion specs. Yep. So, um, that is good shit. 
Um, we have, let me go to, I'm gonna get rid of this uh, diner here. Look at this. Boom, and now you're back on the spaceship. With the, the some TV magic. Yay! Are Anwar and Malati um, gonna stay with us for this mission or are they gonna stay yeah, they back? Are. Nope, they're going to be boots on the ground, traveling and fighting alongside you. Okay. Um, do you guys want to go talk to the wombats? Um, yeah, let's let's have that scene. Um, so I'm gonna drag over some of the wombats as I go. Um, What's a group of wombats called? Uh, wombs. <laughs> I was gonna say wombi. <laughs> wombs is good. <laughs> A herd of wombs. Is it like a, uh, a flock of wombats? Oh my or a god, it's called a wisdom a of gaggle. wombats. A wisdom? It's a wisdom of wombats. Wow, that's oh, perfect. That's great. Or a colony. Yeah. But that's, that's awesome. All right, so you guys collect your wisdom of wombats. Um, I think I have all the wombats here. I'm going to double check. Caden, Brad, Dirk, Mesa, and Liko. Um, and I will go through and make sure that each of these have their nameplate visible. Um, so, you guys will be going on a mission with said wombats. Um, I, how do you want to do this scene? You guys, you guys tell me. If I might suggest, hmm. I somehow feel like this scene starts with somebody, perhaps Avalyn, uh, texting Liko. I will totally be texting Liko. <laughs> Is it like while you're at the bar and talking with them and they're like, hey, it would be good to have a second group. You already have your phone out under the table. Oh wait. yes, absolutely. Wait, does Avalyn like Liko? Do you mean romantically? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, you do now? I do now, yes. <laughs> now that I, I, I guess it. for the sake of canon, uh, Avalyn is bisexual, yes. So, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Is no, no. I'm just, I'm wondering because like half of our group is crushing on the wombats at this point. That's true. So, um, <laughs> so Liko is very um, Liko has some kind of relationship with Otema that most people would describe as them dating. Um, although uh, they would both insist that they're not dating. Um, they just spend a lot of time in each other's rooms. Um, so, Liko and uh, and Avalyn's best friend Otema are essentially dating. Um, I assume that your relationship to or your feelings towards Liko might be a little bit of a crush, and it might be probably more so than that. It's just the like jealousy, you know, like like that they've like <laughs> found something that works for them. Yes, and you haven't, and that's frustrating. And so every time you see either of them do something that's like cute or romantic, it's kind of like a punch in the gut. Yeah, I would guess that like, just to expand on it, she probably does, or at least did have feelings for Liko, but it's one of those things where she's like, no, I love Liko and Atema too much. I wouldn't tr possibly try to do anything like that. I just have vast amounts of respect for them both. Yeah, and all things you respect that rap um exactly sure um okay so you text uh Liko also Blovin is upside down he is <laughs> just for fun <laughs> he just does that something it was a it was a hover chair accident <laughs> my heart he doesn't know how to get it back up right <laughs> this is the sound of what happens when Blovin gets in a hover chair accident oh no 
<laughs> I love Flovin so much. Okay, um, so yeah, Avalyn, you text Liko. What's that like? Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, okay. So you, you guys who are crushing on the wombats though should realize this is uh, like in how it was sold to us, this is almost a suicide mission. Yep. Which is why Roy is silent and just kinda chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I yes, mean, like bring the wombat <laughs> people on the on the Gemini take on our suicide missions. Hey guys, cool thing. <laughs> it just goes to show that we feel more confident with our loved ones around on a potential suicide mission. Yeah. Okay, so, um... So, yes, I think you guys meet up with them. Um, Anwar and Malati come with you uh, on the Gemini when you guys uh, hop back to... Or come with you on the Dalanga when you hop back to the Gemini, um, and, uh, at, when you get to the hangar, the wombats are all, um, settled in and ready to party. Um, they have their own, uh, they have their own carrier ship type thing that, uh, they are ready to help with. I actually want to look up, because I have a list of vehicles here, and I have one in mind for them. Um, uh, space shuttle cruiser. Um, yeah, um, so they have a, a battle cruiser, um, which is not... I mean, it is the same size as a cargo ship, except much more, like, it is a military vehicle rather than a cargo-carrying vehicle. Um, but, uh, so that, that, that will handle their side of transport. Um, now, before we can do the mission, we need to go over what the plan is. Um, do you guys have any scenes you want to cover before we start going into planning territory? So, uh, it would... What's the actual nature of the area that we're going into? I, I may have missed this, but is it the ship? Or is it the planet? Where are we going? The answer to that is yes. Oh. Um, actually, I think that that's a perfect transition into this. Oh, the God planning stage. It. Let's plan, plan, plan. My mouse. Okay. Um, so, this is uh, Fatimoru, which is the world ship of um, their uh, Elfin community. So, um, in my first version of this drawing, I had two separate people of the two people that I asked for opinions told me that it looked like a banana. So... I did what I could to make it not look like a banana. Um, <laughs> it, I, I was one of those people. I came in and I was like, "Is that a banana?" And Brent just threw up her arms, like, "I'm fucking done with all of you." Um, <laughs> yeah, it's cool okay, space so, banana. <laughs> so it is a, it is a single spaceship, which is the size of a small planet, um, many times larger than Earth's moon. Um, I would say about halfway in size between the size of Earth and the size of Earth's moon. Mars. That's how big Mars is. Yeah. Cool. Sure. It's about the size of Mars. Um, it has this, like, there is a shape to the boat itself that implies that it, like, 
it looks like a boat that was made at like a ship dock and it has like a almost like a prow head like it has this filigree to it um it has solar sails kind of similar to the well not solar sails solar panels um similar to the ones that the um gemini has and they're these transparent um almost like leaves that spread out like butterfly wings away from the ship um and then inside of the bowl of the ship you can see here there's this like concave planet and you should think of this kind of like i have to assume that everybody here has played the video game halo um the 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 ring of halo is to like just just this one giant concave planet have you ever seen treasure planet i have the moon do they go inside of it uh it's like a station it's it's yeah i only vaguely remember it um so to answer anais's question yes those are mountains um remember this ship is about the size of mars so those mountains are actually like way bigger than you would expect mountains to be. Those are, um, every, that tall mountain in the middle is like the size of the famous mountain on Mars. Um, Olympus Mons. Olympus, Olympus Mons. The one that is large enough that it like changes the shape of the continent. Um, yeah. Um, and then this flat space, I, tr I tried to kind of do like topography lines a little bit uh, to indicate height. This uh, flat space that they are all sitting on is an ocean. Um, so, like, this, uh, this continent here that goes from here to here is um, maybe the size of Australia or larger maybe the size of South America on the on the large end, I want to say. Um, so it is a continent. Um, and that is the region that we're going to be operating within because your goal is to get here. This um, lump here. Actually, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put down some stars. Um, is this on the map layer? Good. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, oh, come on. This mound here is, um, the capital city of the Fatima Ru. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Oh no. Delete. Copy. Paste. 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 Okay. Um, so. There are five points of interest, and um, I will label these eventually. Um, the first is the tallest mountain on Fatima Ru. Um, it's going to be the easiest place for you guys to do a landing. Hmm. Try refreshing. Okay. Keep going. Um. Yeah, mine are or sorry. Um, the first is the tallest point on the mountain of Batimaru, mm. um, which uh is probably where you guys are going to have to do your landing because um <laughs> when they were leaving there was already a sizable um, Zenotian swarm of aerial 
um, creatures, aerial defense, aerial interference that made it so that the longer you guys are in the air, the more dangerous it's going to be. Um, the, uh, this point is going to require you to be in the air for the least amount of time. And then once you're on the ground, you're going to be a little bit safer. Not safe, but a little bit safer. Um, then from there, we've got this, um, this other peak of the mountain, uh, which contains the communication center for um, for the Fatima Ru, um, that is how it communicates with, um, I mean, like humans and and any other planets in the area, as well as how it can instantaneously communicate with all other world ships across the galaxy. Um, so that is going to contain the SOS beacon, which is the like first priority because if they try to do things by going down the grapevine and sending it to like you know an alefin embassy and then getting a messenger to take it to a world ship and then getting that world ship to like send out the call like that's going to slow things down a lot mm -hmm. if we can set off that sos beacon it's going to like take weeks off of the amount of time required for um for the armada to get here and start cleaning up the world ship and that's going to increase the amount that they're able to save um so first uh land on the peak second um get the sos beacon to go off um and then third you need to get to the capital city which is right here um and that is where the heart stone is going to be located um to get there there are two options. You can either um, go around the continent on the north side, which is going to be overland and going to require you to cross a bridge over a, um, a large river, um, but you'll be able to use your vehicles. Um, so that is just you're going to have to deal with a lot of like interference, but it'll be straightforward interference. Essentially, you guys are just going to have to blast your way across a battlefield. The other option is to go south across the continent, and the whole southern side of the continent is one <laughs> giant forest, almost like a rainforest. Um, if you go that way, you will be much stealthier, but you're going to have to travel for like days through a scary dark forest infested with monsters so um once we get to that point you guys will have to make the choice of uh how to do that um so first step is before we can figure anything else out we have to figure out how to get to our landing zone discuss did you cover what those other two stars are um, yeah, that's the, the north route or the south route to the city. Oh. Is north this route one right here north. the highest point? Huh? Is this the highest point right yes. here? Okay. Yes. Um, and is there any chance that a water landing would be feasible? Um, the only problem with doing a water landing is that, uh, you would spend more time in the air, which is more time for the um, aerials and ocean creatures to get to you while you're relatively defenseless. Also, uh, if the notions are like taking assimilating things, biological things, I would imagine water being like their primary place of. The, well, they're crazy as shit, because there's more life in waters, just yeah. generally speaking, than there is on land. Um, one, one other thing, I don't know if this will affect your decision-making, but um, I didn't have a good way that I could draw it on here without creating a lot of confusion. Um, <clears throat> this beam that goes over the top is a, like, um, 
It's like a solid gold bridge that goes from one point to the other. Um, and then coming down from that bridge is a like force field kind of thing that contains the um, uh, atmosphere. atmosphere. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and inside of that atmosphere, because remember, this is the size of like many continents. We're talking about a, the size of a planet here. There are entire weather patterns of clouds. Um, so that's something you can take into account when considering a, a, a landing pattern is that there's very little Zenotian presence above the clouds. You're mostly going to have to deal with them once you get through the clouds. Could you um, highlight our target again once we actually land? The rightmost dot. Well, that's that's the highest point in the mountain. That's yeah. the one you think we should land on. Well, that's... it's also right next to the SOS beacon, which is going to be the first point that you have to hit. Ah, fair. That's fair. what I was thinking, too, just because less uh, Zenotians in the air or less interference in the air because we'd be high up. How... Uh... How close are all these points relatively? So, like, if we were to land on the rightmost dot, uh, the SOS station that's next to it, would we be able to see it from where we land? Oh yeah, uh, the map is um, a, the map that I have presented to you is not um, entirely like to scale. Um, the two peaks are pretty close to each other, maybe like an hour or two trek apart. Um, and then um, the from the mountain peak to the capital is a long distance. I'm thinking of that island as the size of Australia. So however long it would take to drive across Australia. If we want to um, set off the SOS thing, wouldn't it feasibly work for us to land on that highest point and then I could just teleport to the SOS beacon since I can see it? Um, you could teleport to that peak, yes. Um, and you could warp back and forth and teleport um, your buddies over one at a time. Um, one thing to be aware of, I mean, that's a very valid strategy. Um, one thing to be aware of, it's going to use some energy on your part, um, which I don't normally track, but... Um, if you're going to be going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for, let's see, seven members of your party plus seven-ish members of their party, 14 trips um, times two, because you have to teleport backwards after each one, 28-ish uh, teleportations, um, that's going to be pretty exhausting. Yeah, I would be fine with that incurring a cost. I'm just trying to think of things that could save us some time just because, like, it's we have a lot to go over. And I felt like just based off what we were told for the mission, it's like time is of the essence. So, yeah, no, that's great. I love that you're um, I love that you're thinking that way. Did anybody else have anything that they thought we would well, so benefit my, from doing? My thing is the reason that we're being called in is because the army will take days or weeks to get here. But if we <laughs> land all the way over here, and then don't then also fly the over there. The army is going to take months to get oh, here. months. Okay, so, that, that takes care of that. So Roy's uh, class is that of, like, what, a scout, right? Yeah, um, scout. So I imagine that the teleportation burden on Avalon would be lowered because um, I wouldn't actually need to be teleported to that uh, beacon that's near the top peak. I could just take the uh, mag platform down to it. Mm. Um, um, well, and, and there's no reason you guys can't... In fact, I highly recommend that you guys take vehicles um, over land uh, to get between places. Just be aware that... Um, it, the way that I'm thinking of it is, like, <laughs> basically assume, assume that this whole uh, world has, like, anti-aircraft cover. Um, 
So any kind of aerial travel is going to put you at a lot of danger, yeah. whereas ground-based travel puts you at a lot less danger. Um, but uh, you guys have vehicles, and um, if you need to, you can rent some more ground-based vehicles. I think Kevin, I was talking with Kevin about this level the other day, and he said, like, hey, let's just rent some Jeeps. <laughs> Go with Jeep and it, it always works in the past. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a good question. How do you guys plan to get around when you're uh, on the continent? So walking around, I can actually, I don't know how often we can use stunts, but for let's say we get to a large chasm or some piece of land that's difficult to cross, I can use the drone to create like a moving environment for us to walk over dangered grounds. Um, it would probably be easier for you to just do a hard light construct. Um, or that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I didn't think about that, but yeah. Um, I imagine that I would, would, does that plus like just the scouting ability in general take some of our, take some of the time off? Take some it's of the danger off? Move things easier and faster. Yes. Word. Oh, I have another question. Um, some of y'all are good at hacking. Is there any way that yep. we could do this remotely to the uh, <laughs> SOS beacon activation? I do have a drone. Um, <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, I think you will be able to do some things uh, by drone. Um, I think trying to like break into a Zenotian infested capital and uh, retrieve the Hearthstone and get out intact, done entirely by drone with, uh, you know, communication lag is going to be an issue. Um, oh, I was, I was mostly just concerned with the SOS beacon, which seems like it could be more uniquely electronically oriented kind of submission to this whole plot. The heart zone, obviously, we're going to go in. Actually, you know, shock the, um, the SOS beacon itself is not electronic because it's Alphen. What? Yeah, no, Alphen don't use electronics. They use, um, uh, it's more like a like a nervous system because they have living technology. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, it's more like nerves that, that run through a series of, like, plant-esque um uh, control panels. Um, can uh, can a person hack nerves? Um, not with, not with software skill. Ruda could, except we've established Ruda is dumb as rock. He is mm. bricks. <laughs> Ruda mm. is Ruda that, is that's that's where he smashes the. <laughs> the are inside the computer. Um, wow. Yeah. Some Zoolander shit. <laughs> but no, I do think that it makes a lot of sense for you guys to... It, don't discredit drones. Um, at the very least, one of the girls in the um, on the Wombats is a drone specialist. So she can do things like... If there's a path that you think might be dangerous, she could have her combat drones like run down it ahead of time um, and do stuff like that. Uh, also, I think um, is one. None of I us are pilots. Um, no. Another question for you, Brent. Hey, one second. Um, Kevin, a mill's a pilot, right? Okay. When Kevin gets back. Amil is a pilot, which means he has all drone proficiencies. Um, so we could hook Amil up with some dope ass um, combat drones to help you guys out. Okay, so normally this option's not really on the table, as we're trying to basically save, you know, as much as we can from this. But really, you know, I think a little orbital bombardment may be on the table uh, to a degree. Is that a? Is that a? realistic possibility for what we have yeah could we um, like you know with that with that upper middle route that seems to have a lot of baddies on it um could we just like bomb it 
and then that makes her path a lot less um Zenosha. yeah that's a that's a great idea i mean there's like see here's the thing there are like villages along the way there but those villages everyone in them is dead and um right. and uh and those villages are already like essentially turning into Zenosian hives where they're pumping out like abominations. So right. I don't think they're trying to save that. They want to save the <laughs> as a whole, but um, they're not concerned about the individual villages. So that's a great idea if like finish the SOS and then if you guys decide to go the northern route, Fucking, yeah. I mean, have a have so, a bomber come in and drop some. Uh... Who's proficient in uh, enriching uranium? <laughs> <laughs> Emil is definitely proficient in um, enriched uranium. That would um, make sense, actually. Kevin, I don't know if you heard, but uh, uh, hold on, hold on, Blovin. I've read extensively about yep. it. We'll need several hundred million dollars and a megawatt of electricity. <laughs> um, I'm in right up. <laughs> so, uh, one thing I was going to say, Kevin, uh, because Emil is a pilot and a machinist, is that both yes. correct? Uh -huh. um, because he is both of those, he is super proficient in uh, drones. He is as proficient as is possible in drones. Mm -hmm. So I can hook you up with some, like, some, like, military-grade, um, like, combat drones and you can use that as needed when like clearing out an area like like checking out an area to deal with the Zenotians before sending the meat sacks in yeah mm -hmm. um are we the meat sacks um well it, whether or not a mill is a meat sack is up to you to decide we he's have... definitely a goop sack he's a goop sack okay. yeah um okay so I uh, thanks, Zach. <laughs> we'll go over that because I love <laughs> the idea of a mill having some combat drones, and in fact, I don't know why we haven't done that before. It's it would be so good. I I'm gonna be walking around this whole game just in a VR headset, like clicking away at a keyboard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you've got just just like a small Gundam walking around behind you. Yes. Um, all right, so Emil's gonna have combat drones. Um, um, I'm definitely taking my wraith. Yeah, definitely take your wraith. Um, who is it? Uh, Caden, Brad, um, I'm trying to decide who in the, the wombats would be their pilot, and, um, I'm guessing it would be Caden. Yeah, he's going to be a Vanguard, comma, pilot. Um, so, Caden is... Well, we can have this conversation. It. You're probably not going to be able to easily land whatever ship you guys bring in on that... Um, that mountain because of all the like crossfire that you're going to have coming in it's likely that the ship would be damaged and then um not be able to get back out easily so um Caden would recommend he flies by in their like assault ship and um sticks all of the party in drop pods and then just fucking uh, drop pods you guys down to the mountain. Um, that way you guys can avoid some of the aerial interference. And then when you guys need somebody to do the Oriole, bo Oriole bombardment, bombard the Orioles. Um, when you guys <laughs> need to do the aerial bombardment and need other like aerial um, support, he will be hanging out in like around the atmosphere around the planet doing like an orbit and as needed he can come by and do a, a flyby with his ship how does that sound to nice. you guys that sounds great yeah, yeah. that's cool yeah. yeah um kevin Acceptable. how how do you feel about 
the Galanga not being, uh, oh, actually, you wanted to have the Galanga have, like, an extra, uh, <laughs> I'm imagining one of those, um, things that they put on, uh, carrier boats, um, the, just the giant crates. Uh, I'm imagining you just, like, zip-tying one of those to the bottom of the Galanga. Yep. Um, it, so, yeah, you do want to have the Galanga available for extraction, but you probably don't want to do... I set it on an autopilot route and, and just orbit around the ship. Just orbit around. Okay. Um, and then Caden can, can be protecting it. In yeah. Between health. Um... One thing is, uh, as we go, you guys will probably have some options to take out certain Cenotian members that will um, weaken their like military strength because Cenotians work um, as a kind of insectoid hive mind. So um, you will have like one Cenotian that handles like communications for a whole region and that is like the kind of like the queen hive mind on that region and if you take that out then all of the smaller ones in the region lose like big picture um um coordination and there's like another bug that you can take out that will like weaken their um anti-aerial capacity and stuff like that it's like that mm. time day after tomorrow okay a lot like that Tom Cruise movie. Does, does Malati have any sense of where those are located? Not currently, because we don't have a um, we don't have a tactical understanding of the thing. We just have the one person who survived the attack because um, they essentially got her on a ship and fired her off the second they sensed trouble. Very few other people survived from the planet. Um, so, yeah, we don't know where these things are, but as you guys are on planet, um, hmm. let's, let's do this because I think it's, it's most interesting if you guys have a way to at least locate them. <laughs> let's say that they have a, essentially like a, like a, like a Dragon Ball Z dragon radar, uh, thing <laughs> that can, um, isolate, that can locate different kinds of Xenotian subbreeds, which do different things. And then you guys can use that to isolate different um, particular members that you need to take out for strategic purposes. Um, that is, a device like that is something that almost certainly, um, like, the Terran military would have created at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I think that you guys can probably get it on the black market, especially using one of your black market merchant contacts on mm -hmm. the Gemini. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that we can do that. The only thing that needs to happen for us to do that is we are going to have to come up with an NPC who's your like fucking black market tech dealer. Um, so. Oh god, can he just be Kevin? I didn't know Kevin wanted to become an arms dealer, but Oh no, you I thought you meant tech dealer, not arms dealer. No, it's the know. same thing. <laughs> okay. Um help me come up with this character. Um I'm going to be looking for a sprite for them. Um start shouting out some things that we know about your black market uh Bold dealer person bald definitely okay should i google i didn't say it was a strong <laughs> i'm not gonna google that um this guy owns a chain of fun houses what on, di on different planets yeah he's real skeevy like that and he All just right. like does his like black arms dealing at those fun houses. Wait, hold on. Did any of our um, NPCs from uh, the game the other night do um, black market shit? No, I don't think so. 
That's very impressive. Um. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hold on. I think I found him. I think I found the one. The one and only. The man of my heart. The man of my dreams. Um, are you guys all looking on the the Gemini? Mm hmm Look at this. Look at this absolute unit and tell me he does not sell <laughs> missiles to foreign entities. He's like, I'll sell missiles to children if they got the coin. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, give me a name for this fucker. His name is Strom. S-T-R-O-L-M. S-T-R-O-M. <laughs> Strom Furman. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> you like okay. what I did there? Strom Furman. <laughs> going in. Um... Uh, click, edit. I imagine he uses the word heritage a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> History, heritage, our culture, our values. Ugh, I hate him. Does the entire party hate dealing with this guy? <laughs> <laughs> All is um, safe here. War lies elsewhere. We are chosen. This is God's land. Oh, I didn't know we were giving voices this game. That's great. <laughs> hey, that was it. actually a line from a Rage Wait, song. Like, that sounds like it was from Bioshock Infinite. <laughs> nope, that was from Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> Are you uh, sure oh. that wasn't Bioshock Infinite? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Ashes okay. in the fall. Um, Strom Furman, a majestic, beautiful um, arms dealer who just constantly <laughs> smells like cigar smoke, oh. even though you've never seen him smoke a cigar. Um, <laughs> he just it, something about his energy just lets off in a uh, sort of miasma of cigar smoke. I smell the um, it's a good business I... partner of mine, yes. <laughs> That's what I was. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I smell the cigar smoke and then I reach up onto Blovin's machine and hit the perfume. Yeah, the, uh, the, Mikhail's gif is very appropriate. Yeah, he needs to be wearing that, and then that's all. Everything else can stay the same. Um, okay, you see the parts of his hair that are bald, <laughs> the, the too deep, uh, the like V that goes back into his head. It's that, except it's artificial. He has shaved it and has that plastic thing there holding it in place. Um, the absolute, the worst, the grossest. Okay. So this guy is going to get you your drones and your, uh, what else did, did we need? Um, oh, your drones and your, um, um, d sensors, your, um, the notion, um, that's very good because, um, if we're going to have a Zenotion substitution sensor, that means that you guys will also have a little bit of a, like, radar that says when they're closing in on you. And I think that's very good for dramatic purposes. No, so actually, actually, wait, no. Emil actually wants to homebrew his Zenotion sensor. Mm -hmm. It is literally, it is a biological life sensor. He's going to buy two sensors, a biological life sensor and a warp shadow sensor. And it's going to... Anything that has one and not the other, it is. Um, sensor. I don't know that there is any technology that can sense warp shadows because oh. machines don't exist in the warp. Hmm. Um, I don't. So here's the thing. This is a fascinating question because machines don't exist in the warp. So how do you measure the warp if a machine doesn't exist in the warp? Well, Metaphor. biological creatures exist in the warp. So maybe if you did something where you have like a, a petri dish full of bacteria and you somehow use a device to measure the reaction of that bacteria, you could infer things about the warp by like specializing the bacteria to be highly warp sensitive. I have a but it would be very I have a petri dish full of nerve cells. <laughs> and the nerve cells send electrical signals that I interpret. Yeah, I think this is, 
I like the idea that this is a technology that is being worked on in the galaxy. Um, and in fact, I guarantee oh, that Red Corp, Red Corp is working on this. I was thinking about Red Corp. Uh, more I think about the Zenotians, the more they sound like almost like a virus that has invaded uh, biological bodies instead of like a well put together program like Roy that has been implanted directly. Very viral in nature. Um, mm -hmm. What'd you say? They are very viral in nature. Yeah. You are correct to think that way. Um, so yes, um, mm -hmm. those guys will definitely um, be doing that. Um, so, so, um, let's say that you, they get you a Zenotian subspecies sensor, and then you are able to basically tear it apart and further modify it. Mm. Um, so why don't you make a hardware check for me? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. I just want to, I want to. Also, I, um, I enjoy the fact that you had to buy two of them because there was a very good chance that one of them was going to be destroyed. Yep. Oh. 11 is not bad. That's true, that's true. That red box means that one of your dice came up as a 1, so it looks like you rolled a 1 and a 5, mm -hmm. which is still pretty much the average. Um, so... It's the average, but plus 5. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fantastic. By the I way, like Mikhail, I, I am currently playing Dragon Ball Z uh, Kakarot, and it brings me great, great joy. It's a fantastic oh, game. We'll have to talk about that offline because I'm, I'm interested to know how how that plays. I've had my own in for a while. Oh, we will talk on it after after the the meeting. Um, okay, so uh, you rolled an eleven, and eleven is considered like great. Um, so. What do you think the modification made to your Zenotian subspecies sensor does? Uh, I I am going to um, modify it to give us like the best word I can think of is like relative power levels, but like <laughs> the extent to which the how big the Zenotian is, how like much of a threat threat they are. Cool, cool, cool. You have the the fucking Dragon Ball Z. Uh, sensor that Vegeta has. Its power level is over ten thousand. Yeah, every time you every time you look at something you just hear tick 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 oh, oh, and then oh, oh, the power it's level. Even higher. Oh wait, 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 wait. <laughs> can I can I make it one of those sensors on the side like that? Yeah, yeah, one yeah, on Yeah, that that's my that's that's my addition. It does power level and it goes over my eye. Yeah, and also those power levels do go over 9,000 in certain conditions. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to add that 9, to your inventory. I can't remember if inventory... Um, uh, weapons, armor, here we go, gear. Um, protocol buddy and... Um, gear, uh, combat, drones, times two, and, um, come on, add. Um, the next one is going to be, um, modded, uh, How about modded bioform scanner? Yeah, um, I like that. So it is designed with Zenotians in mind, and it can tell you special subtypes of Zenotians, but also it functions on like any kind of biological creature. So if you point it at like a tiger, it will tell you like the 
like relative strength of the tiger and a little bit about like you know it is like a a mammal versus a fish or something like you know it has it can break down a few phenotypes at um at a glance um Um, can detect, uh, any Xenosian within, okay, hold on, uh, can detect exact location of any Xenosian within, uh, What's a good what's a good um, range for this to be able to work as a radar? Um, I don't know, two hundred feet. Yeah, that sounds appropriate. Um, within two hundred feet, uh, and it can also can locate um, Read power levels and basic biological capabilities of any um, Okay. Uh, so the the ultimate name for this is just the spell Libra from Final Fantasy. Um, okay. Um, so you have a modded bioform scanner. You have combat drones, which will prove helpful. We are talking about. We have a strategy for. Um, what's his name is going to keep you guys in orbit, um, or he's going to stay in orbit and provide aerial cover and um, pick up when you're done. And um, he's going to stay in orbit, provide aerial cover and pick up when done and provide aerial bombardment as needed. I don't think we need anything else for the planning phase, correct? I'm moving us back to the Fatima group. Okay. Then, uh, we've been playing for a little over two hours. Um, I would like to stop it here and then um, do lots of prep for our um, next game for the next time we play. So, uh, the next time we play, we can jump right in to you guys, uh, uh, parachuting in to the mountain peak and then making your way to the SOS beacon and then, um, making your way to the capital and fighting lots and lots of creepy alien hordes along the way. Um, yeah. We've done a good mm -hmm. amount of prep here. Um, do does anybody have any questions or any logistics they want to clear up before we pack? Uh, yeah, I feel like we covered a lot of ground today, like in preparation for what we're doing next. Yeah, which is oh, it, I had I had one other follow up. Yeah, what did we decide about the online transport? Did we ever get jeeps or something? Ooh, we did not. Um. What do you guys want to do about that? I tell you what, uh, I'm going to give you guys a list of vehicles and you can rent one or more as needed. Um, 
So first is Scout Bike. It's designed for off-roading and getting around various uh, environments. It's very small and very fast. Um, there's also a Lancer, which is a Scout Bike plus a machine gun, and it's a lot clunkier. Um, then when we get into uh, larger vehicles, there's a sports car. Probably not your best bet for off-roading. Um, there's a truck. Better bet for off-roading. Um, airplane and helicopter. Not great for reasons previously discussed. Um, there is the recon frame, mecha sports frame, um, and the mobile base. Uh, none of those... I mean... Does anybody want to pick up a recon frame or mecha sports frame? Um, what looks like that? Okay, let me let me get in here and look at this here picture. Um, that I want is one of them. Uh, I mean, that is literally any Alefin vehicle. That's the, that is what the Alefin technology is based on, is inspired by. Um, so. If Ruda had a speeder, that's what it would look like. Sick. Um, I think I'm doing my race, honestly. Yeah, okay, so you're just taking a race. Um, I'm going with my vehicle. What is your I'm vehicle? Need, uh, is I'm going to need a render. Uh, Zai? What's up? Zai, what did you say your vehicle was? Is the mag the platform. Hoverboard? Yeah, the hoverboard. Oh, the mag platform. Right, right, I remember. That's good for you. Um, so, I can't remember I wanna, how many... I want to rent one of these bikes. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to do you want a hover bike? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Hold on. Going back here. Uh, hover bike for Blovin... And um, Jeep for so that leaves Avalyn. Um, Emil's good because Emil's got his recon frame. Um, so Avalyn, mate, and Roy. No, Roy's good. Um, Ruda's got his thing. Is it just Avalyn and Mate who are unaccounted for in terms of ground vehicles? Yeah, and is there any way that I could ride with someone, or would I have to have my own vehicle with well, my own ground say, transport? How about how about? Oh no, I love. Hold on, we hold could on, get a guys, tandem. Bear with me. <laughs> Avalyn and Mate rent a buggy together. Oh my God! Yes, absolutely. All right, that fits. <laughs> I'm with that. <laughs> What what is a buggy? Isn't that like an old school thing? Buggy, of course, know. and buggy. It, that that word felt felt right to me. Let me Google it. Oh my! Just Google the word buggy, and you will be looking at exactly what I had in mind. This thing offers no protection from the elements whatsoever. <laughs> this thing looks like it's made out of PVC. This thing might, in fact, be made out of PVC. It's amazing. I love it so much. And yes, this is absolutely what you guys are going to be riding around um, this, uh, this elephant planet on. Mm. Okay, so what happens if I type in dune buggy? Because I think that buggies, I think that have like uh, tires meant for the sand. Yeah. Okay. Um. So vehicles are figured out. Um. I think that is the last of the planning we had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now everybody except uh. Mikhail can log off because Mikhail and I need to talk about Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. 
Yeah, let me just wind <laughs> down on all the the post production stuff. <laughs> we can go ahead and talk about DBZ. Or all right, y'all. Uh, all right. See you next weekend. Next time. Hey now. Catch y'all next week. Weekend. Peace. Bye. Bye.